Um, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our, our speaker for, for today um, in the Environmental Engineering Graduate Seminar Series at Michigan Tech. Um, before I do introduce our speaker, I wanna just go over a few um, details, management issues. We are changing the format of the, of the Zoom meetings just a bit to limit um, the disruptions. So all speakers will be muted um, uh, only this, the presenters will be unmuted um, and uh, attendees will also not have the opportunity to share their video. If you would like to ask a question, uh, either during the seminar or at the end of the seminar, please raise your hand and we will unmute you, um, but not turn on the video. So just uh, again, that's a new uh, process that we're following. Also, just a reminder that if you want continuing education credits to document that, please contact Dr. Eric Seagren. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker. It gives me great pleasure to uh, have Ed Verhammy uh, presenting today. He, Ed is a Great Lakes engineer working for Limno Tech, and he's an alum of our program. Ed graduated from Michigan Tech in 2003 with a bachelor's in environmental engineering um, and uh, in 2005, he received a master's degree in, in environmental engineering. And he was actually the first graduate student uh, to perform research work on the uh, research vessel Agassiz, which is now 18 years old. Um, and he did it, conducted that research under the guidance of Dr. Marty Auer. Uh, Ed has been working for the past 16 years at Limnotech in Ann Arbor and works exclusively on projects involving the Great Lakes, including modeling of surface water and development of sensor networks. He is currently serving as the president of the International Association of Great Lakes Research, which is a great honor. And he ha himself had the honor of bestowing the Lifetime Achievement Award from that association on his past uh, advisor, Dr. Marty Auer, and that was in 2019. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed um, to talk about next generation sensor networks in the Great Lakes. So thank you, Ed, and welcome. Great, thank you. I know I know I wrote that introduction, but thank you for, for all, those, all those kind words. It's really great to hear, um, uh, well, to be here virtually. I wish I could be there in person. And I, the Iagler Conference was supposed to be hosted on campus this year. And unfortunately, the Great Lakes Research Conference is gonna be virtual. Um, I am going to try and get up to Michigan Tech during the actual conference and, and sort of be up there and help with the um, sort of virtual running of it. So I hope to see uh, uh, some people in person in later in May. So let me share my screen here. And this one. All right. How does that look on your side? That looks great. All right. I see some familiar faces on here. So um, it's great to, to see uh, my uh, past Michigan Tech colleagues again. And it's nice to virtually see everyone here. Please please feel free to um, drop any notes or, or uh, questions you might want to answer in the chat. Um, I will try and um, for sure leave leave time for questions. When I, when I was thinking about um, what to talk about here, I, I, I really just wanted to go through a lot of the projects that I've been working on right now. And I think what's, what's unique about the work that I have um, right now is uh, how multi, multidisciplinary it is. So I sort of ventured from my um, modeling background at Michigan Tech and which is the kind of the first reason I started at Michigan Tech or at Limno Tech and I've migrated over to sensors and monitoring the environment. And I've um, learned a lot with getting into sort of physical things of monitoring the environment. Um, you guys can still see my camera at all. I'm holding up a bracket here. This is just, you know, it's a aluminum bracket. Uh, but what's cool about it is I had to use my CAD skills and I designed it myself and it, it um, takes a standard off the shelf web camera and it makes it so we can easily mount it uh, to a buoy. Um, so just that, that sort of base engineer skill set 
has proven surprisingly useful for me and, and it's really allowed me to take uh, a lot of these skills into the environmental space. And I, I know um, uh, sort of environmental engineering itself has come from a background of uh, growing out of civil. And I think I've, I've seen it expand even more to just encompass all of the engineering disciplines from computer science to um, electrical engineering to mechanical. And it's, it's really, how do we get engineers out in the natural environment? And in my case, in the water, water environment on the Great Lakes, um, make measurements, provide data, right, and understand trends and conditions that we can't um, always see. So I, I'm just gonna, my dog's here squeaking his toy. Okay. Um, so I've been at Limnotech for 16 years now. And one thing that's um, typical of a consultant is you work a lot of, work for a lot of clients. So here I just put a slide, just talking about mostly our real-time sensor work. So we've, we've, we've really grown to support uh, water treatment plants, nuclear power plants, uh, boating clubs, cities, and a lot of universities. I think I've found that there's a lot of university biology departments, in particular limnology, water science, that really need that engineering support um, on, on how to get out on the water, take measurements, handle data. Um, so it's um, engineering consulting certainly takes you a lot of, a lot of places and a lot of um, unique clients in the region. Um, one thing that's also unique, and I think this is, um, you know, as engineers, we don't generally like to um, think about the sort of policy or politics side of our, our job. And I'd say I've kind of turned myself into an advocate of my own work. So taking measurements of the Great Lakes, it's, it's not something that um, we should take for granted that, that people even know that we can do. Um, that we can um, take these different sensors, put them together and get on a boat and go and put a new sensor out on the lake. So I've really tried to be an advocate um, for the media. Whenever we're doing a new project, we'll get familiar with the TV stations and the uh, newspaper people, send them links to the projects that we're doing and try and get them out in the field. And, and I think this really pays off uh, for most engineering projects, I mean, these are public projects. We're, we're, we're taking public dollars usually, we're building infrastructure. And so the more we can talk about it and get the public involved, I think the better. Um, I've also tried to um, make monitoring more accessible. So, well, there's um, certainly large research boats in the Great Lakes. There's, um, NOAA does a lot of buoy work. How do ordinary, businesses access these same types of services. So how does a nuclear power plant understand the thermocline, understand um, the, the temperature profile and why, why the cold water um, that's coming into their facility suddenly turns warm within a few hour period and how that impacts the efficiency of their, of their plant. Um, so I've sort of um, taken skills that I've learned mostly in academia and transferred those uh, to the private sector and kind of a um, oceanographic um, type service. We've, we've worked for um, potential offshore wind projects. There's probably going to be offshore wind um, structures in Lake Erie soon. I think there's, there's been several developers that have proposed doing offshore wind and, and they really need to understand what's happening on the lake, what's happening below the water. Um, so just um, basic observations of conditions, real-time data, uh, telemetry um, ha has all been involved. And most recently, drinking water. I think uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on um, the quality of drinking water. And as we know, um, between Flint and other cities that have sort of struggled with the changing source water quality, how do we better track source water so we can understand how to better treat water? Um, I really really tried to put more sensors into the hands of operators that are on the job 24 seven watching for change in source water so they can adjust uh, treatment at the plant. And we'll talk more about that. But one, one thing in particular that I've seen in my 10 years that I've been doing monitoring work is 
is we've certainly seen advances in technology. We've seen the, the cost of stuff come down in particular, but, but what's really changed is, is our ability to um, create clear specifications for what we wanted to monitor, why we want to monitor, what's the performance of the instrumentation that we need, and what are the what are the, the ten year life cycle costs? So, um, you know, we often find that the initial cost of the equipment here. I'm sort of quoting a: in 2011, we spent seventy five thousand dollars to buy the buoy and all the monitoring equipment you see here. Um, it weighed about six hundred pounds. We had about five hundred um, to seven hundred pounds of uh, anchor weight to keep the buoy there. Um, it was about $20,000 a year in operation and maintenance costs between the engineer's labor to service the equipment, bring it out, tow it out to the spot. Um, so 10 year life cycle costs of about 325,000, um, which is, you know, if you're a nuclear power plant that just goes on a line item budget for maintenance. And, but what we're really providing is a, is a, pretty big platform that we can swap out sensors, we can get uh, high quality atmospheric measurements. Um, but what if we don't quite need that big of a platform? What if we know the specific instrumentation we want to have and we don't need to always change it out or reevaluate um, what's happening? So in 2016, we, we basically took the same sensors, I mean, the same observations that we're trying to make, wind speed, and we shrunk the buoy down uh, by almost 50%. Uh, we cut the 10 year uh, maintenance costs down by almost 60 some percent. And we're still getting uh, very high quality observations. Um, you know, we're a little bit closer to the water surface uh, for wind speed, wave heights, our hull characteristics changed a little bit. So, you know, just acknowledging some of these differences in platforms. Um, most people we work with would rather have this smaller buoy that's easier to work with um, than the larger one. And, and we can also start buying more of them. So if you're trying to create a network of sensors, it's easier uh, to work with smaller things. Um, in, in 2020, uh, this, this is a concept buoy that's shown here, but it, you know we, we, we've actually even pushed the, the price of this buoy even smaller. Um, so again, we're still able to make atmospheric measurements um, there's still a wave sensor inside, and we're still continuing to hone in on what's the optimal platform and, and, and really trying to get these maintenance costs. And usually maintenance for sensors comes down to how easy it is to, to bring it in and out and how easy it is to take components on and off that fail. Um, one, one aspect, so if I go back to, to this here, this is sort of one use case. We have a known set of sensors that we started with. And we've just sort of year after year tried to hone the, the size and the 10 year maintenance cost. If we, if we step back to the larger set of decisions that are involved, I tend to break it into um, six different or seven different uh, categories here. So if we imagine on the left, I could have created a, some, a natural environment column. So that would be uh, water, uh, the, the water column, the, the atmosphere, and then we have to choose a sensor that's going to monitor for the change in the environment that we're trying to see. Um, typically, we have to have a data logger on board to collect those raw measurements, average stuff, um, do some transformations of raw voltages, uh, reformat uh, to get ready to uh, send the data out in real time. So I'm mostly talking about real-time data systems here. A um, lot of science will just stop right here with the data logger. You hit, um, you save it internally, you skip all these telemetry and data system steps and you just import the data into Excel. But what we're really trying to build is real-time decision uh, support system. So how do we get the data from the data logger um, out to the internet? And I've just shown some representative methods here from satellite to cellular to Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. And one in, one in particular I'm pretty excited about is called LoRaWAN. Um, this one puts a lot of the uh, uh, technology into people's hands as opposed to having to pay uh, telecoms for uh, cellular access fees. And then the platform. I won't talk too much about the platform, but just know that you can pretty much design 
any shape, size, um, thing that you want floating, um, submerged, and uh, it, it has a lot of implications for the maintenance. Um, and this is where your relationship with your mechanical engineering department can really help with prototyping and manufacturing processes as well. And once we get to the side on the right, we start dealing with um, how do we start handling the data once it gets to the internet? Is it going to a database? Whose database? Who owns it? What's the infrastructure? Is it a cloud service? Um, are you spinning up an instance of Amazon Web Services with some standard architecture? Uh, are you using some open source uh, NSF developed platform? Are you using a someone else's database that's running on a web service like this um, Ubidots? And, and then what does the user interface look like? What are you trying to do, actually do with the data? Send alerts, give people a view of the data. And then we finally reach our end user where someone's hopefully gonna make a decision um, either within the next hour, uh, within the next day uh, about that data. So the, the end user um, usually drives, you're usually designing this system from the right-hand side all the way to the left-hand side and who's your end user and what's the decision they're trying to make and then how do you develop this system um, i did just want to pause for a second on the telemetry options and this is this this space is changing so fast that this slide is even out of date um, i i think most people are familiar with uh, some satellite communication networks and maybe some um, you know, wide area networks like cell phones. There's there's so many cellular bands involved. There's so many specifications um, that I'm just amazed at how many options there are to get data uh, from point A to point B in in this satellite space. Um, Elon Musk has launched thousands of satellites. We might see the the need for cellular and even these sort of personal uh, low power wide area networks uh, disappear if we can just throw it up to a spat, uh, satellite. So uh, I would watch this space very closely because this really changes um, what public infrastructure um, or commercial infrastructure you need to get a uh, environmental measurement uh, back to the internet. And, and cost is a consideration here too. I think uh, technologies that push the cost down considerably um, always help our environmental space because of the number of observations that we want to make. Um, so we talked about technology a little bit and all the different components, but let's, you know, actually jump out into the environment here and look at what phenomenon or, or a specific phenomenon. So this is a image of the downtown Toledo in 2017. We can see that the harmful algal bloom has pushed its way all the way up the river. It's green. It's ugly. People know it's probably toxic. Um, how do, we, how do we build a observing system that will support uh, not only the city of Toledo and understanding um, the movement of this, but also can we better treat drinking water to remove those harmful toxins? Uh, just another view of the uh, algal bloom here. You can see just this, a floating scum on the surface, brown water below. Um, this particular shot is for a um, documentary film that it should be coming out this year. So again, just, you know, I've been working to try and get more visibility for these issues that we're working on. Um, this is a view of the city of Toledo's water intake structure. It's a building about four miles offshore and you can just see how green the water is surrounding it. So, you know, the city can't really decide uh, what Lake Erie is gonna throw around it. They just have to suck it in and, and treat it. Um, I do want to remind uh, myself and, and others that, you know, we tend to have uh, a very clinical view of, of some of these conditions with um, looking at uh, processes and measuring phenomenon. But this, this was a graphic that was created by uh, an artist in Toledo, and it was on the um, uh, National Resource uh, Defense Council, the NRDC, I believe, they um, uh, sort of commissioned this piece, but it just shows that the algal bloom was just surrounding residents of the city of Toledo. And it's, you know, the algal bloom or the algae that almost ate Toledo. 
So I just think it's a good reminder that, uh, you know, when an engineer is, is called to help, there's usually uh, a big social impact or a big social uh, uh, concern about this. So the more that we can help, I think, you, you know, bring the data to light, the better. Um, and I just wanted to demonstrate for this water treatment plant network, we chose a particular subset. So we went through this same exercise. We chose a, a high-end sensors, a more scientific data logger, cellular uh, floating platform. So, you know, every time we sort of design an observing network, we're always making decisions across this entire matrix. Uh, just a little graphic again of that water intake out here in the city luckily has about um, two to three hours lead time before that water actually makes its way to the plant itself. So uh, monitoring conditions out at the lake helps them get advance warning of what's coming. Uh, this is the buoy that we had floating off of the water intake. And the graph I show here is uh, the green is the sensor data. So we can see that our real-time sensor data is able to track the uh, concentration of uh, toxins in the water. And it, one thing to note is that this, the toxin data, is, uh, the water samples collected at 6 a.m. And by the time they run it through their internal lab and get a result, it's about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So the city has to pump water all day before they even know what the toxin concentrations were at six in the morning. So they're mostly flying blind and they're mostly relying on yesterday's toxin sample to know how to treat today's water. So what the sensor allows them to do is really understand if there's been any dramatic change in water quality. So we know that our sensors, well, they're not directly measuring toxins. It's they, they correlate well with algal biomass, which in turn correlates well with the amount of toxins that are in the water. So we can affect have a early warning for drinking water um, treatment uh, sensor that helps them know how much uh, activated carbon to add and to really monitor the progression of the bloom. Um, what, what the city had done before they had our sensor was they would uh, over treat. So if they knew that yesterday's water was uh, toxic, had a certain toxic um, concentration of microcystin, they would have a margin of error that would say, well, we need to be able to at least treat at least double or triple that concentration in case the concentration increases overnight. And we know that overtreatment actually leads to a lot more concerns with water quality uh, concerning uh, disinfection byproducts. And uh, just adding lots of chlorine is, is never good for drinking water. So I think our system is really able to help them uh, not only know that they're removing toxins, but they're not also adding additional problems by overtreating the water. So we first started working for the city of Toledo. And then within, it was within a few months, um, you realize that water treatment plants, they, they, they all talk to each other. They all have um, phone conversations. They would call each other, ask, you know, how's your water today? What's it look like? And within, it, within a year, we had secured enough grant funding to install this same um, sensor technology and water treatment plants all the way over to Cleveland and past Cleveland. And so every water treatment plant uh, between Toledo and Cleveland has the same sensor installed. Um, all the data streams uh, real time uh, to the internet and each operator can watch uh, the incoming raw water conditions at every water treatment plant. Um, and this data can also be used by scientists to understand the movement of the bloom. Um, one thing I also wanted to point out is uh, because we're a, we're a consultant, we're also able to um, work for others on the same issue. So we've, we also partnered with a whole host of universities um, to uh, commission other studies of the system um, that, that goes outside of our work with the water treatment plants. So we were able to uh, support a HABS grab as we called it. So we were able to get all these agencies out of the water, um, collect over a, a hundred and, and some water samples and, and really have the largest uh, group sampling effort of a harmful algal bloom uh, ever. So I think um, one thing that this points out is that engineers can really be a source of 
um, uh, collaboration with other uh, organizations. You know, it's, I, I mean, this is mostly a, a logistics exercise, but it was mostly my modeling background that said, we need everyone to uh, collect a water sample on the same day that all these agencies had been collecting um, samples on whatever day they happened to be in their schedule. So we were getting a lot of random snapshots and through a coordination effort, uh, NOAA funding, we're able to do some more coordinated sampling. Um, Ed, I'm going to interrupt here just for a moment. We do have a question in the chat. Noel Urban asked, uh, were you monitoring chlorophyll A at Toledo or cyanophyte pigments? Um, this, this graph, the graph I was showing was uh, phycocyanin. So it was a, a, a pigment. And, uh, you know, during this time of the year, uh, the cyanos are, are dominating. Um, the sort of chlorophyll signature. So chlorophyll would show a very similar trend and so, um, also turbidity would also show a very similar trend as well. Uh, but that's not always the case. So um, it is good that we're just looking at phycocyanin and it does track uh, very well. Now, a lot of scientists would, would say, you know, if I were to ask um, an algal scientist, uh, can we use phycocyanin to predict the presence of toxic algae? They would say, absolutely not. Um, the variability is just too high. Those sensors just don't track what you think they do. Um, and I understand that, but uh, out on Lake Erie, um, when the bloom is happening and there's one species, uh, the characteristic um, matches the signal we're looking for exactly. So it has enough confidence. So, um, you know, I think, you know, I always watch the sort of research standard for performance of sensors. And then I look to, well, what information does an operator need um, that they don't have right now? And what's the best way to get them that, even if it's an imperfect measurement? So, um, you know, we don't really provide a, um, direct uh, formula that others can use saying if the phycocyanin reads this, it's, it's more, you know, get this instrumentation in place, uh, compare it with other processes that are happening and figure out how to use it for your facility. So I think, um, you know, again, just to expand beyond where, where Noel was going, I think it's always important to uh, take the consideration of what data people are using now to make decisions and can can we use science to make that a little bit better, even though we know it's not gonna be a universal um, application. Um, I did wanna point out, so, you know, I've been able to get, you know, physically walk into water treatment plants, tell them I've got a government grant, I'm here to help. Will you let me put this sensor in your pump station? And, uh, it, you know, prior to this project, I always had the view that water treatment plants had a very internal data system that, you know, they didn't like sharing raw data. Their process data was regarded as sort of um, uh, trade secret, and they only really needed to publish uh, the bare minimum of the quality of the water that they're putting out. And you know, what I've what I've seen with this project is um, they really don't know too much about source water. I don't I don't know that that operators that get certified um, really understand. Um, some basic limnology, how, to, how do the, the rivers or lakes, how are they functioning, how dynamic are they? And so, you know, one recommendation I would have is how do we, how do we get more transfer of the limnology uh, into the water treatment plant um, and specifically down to the operator level uh, because it's just so important to understand lake conditions <laughs> or systems that are drawing surface water in particular and in, in how rapid the, the incoming water quality can change. Um, I did want to point out that we're not the only ones putting sensors on Lake Erie. This is a map in 2019 that I made of all of the known sensors that are out on Lake Erie. And not, not all of these are real time, but um, uh, all the blue and green uh, dots are all real time sensors. And then the yellow dots are a uh, fish network. So there's a fish telemetry network that's tracking uh, fish movements across Lake Erie. Um, there's thousands of tag fish 
Uh, the NOAA and the Great Lakes Fish Commission are now working to add um, dissolved oxygen measurements to a lot of these uh, acoustic fish receivers. So, it, you know, the number of sensors on each Great Lake is only going to increase. And I think the more coordination we have, the better, and the more sharing of uh, sort of techs and engineering support, the better as well. Um, I'll, I'll jump through sort of the next application. Um, so I talked about the, the Great Lakes and um, there, there's not too many organizations which really have a boat and get out on the water and measure the open Great Lakes. When we get on, on land, there's a lot more organizations, there's a lot more disciplines that are monitoring the sort of watersheds, the rivers, the lakes, the wetlands. Um, but I've also seen a sort of gap of uh, technology application here. And th this is a project that we secured with the Ohio DNR. They're investing um, almost a billion dollars in restoration of uh, wetlands and agricultural lands uh, to reduce the amount of phosphorus running into Lake Erie and then trying to reduce the size of the harmful algal bloom. So one thing that I would like to see them use is more lower cost sensors and more ways of collecting um, continuous data. It, it, it doesn't need to be real time, but the real time aspect to it just really shortens the time that you need to make a decision um, in, instead of the traditional uh, field year where you collect data, you download it, you analyze it over the next year and you publish the third year. Um, so we're, by, by having the data accessible within that first year, you can start uh, testing your hypothesis, looking for trends, adjust, um, write another grant to fill in data gaps. So I've always pushed people to get real-time data whenever they can, because it really shortens that, that time frame of um, uh, getting output from a project. And for this project, we were more interested in, I'd say, what are the uh, lower parts of this matrix? So cheaper sensors, uh, more data dashboards, you know, we're, we're getting into uh, potentially hundreds to thousands of, of sensors and monitoring sort of the pulse of the watershed. Um, we're also trying to use uh, LoRaWAN technology, which is a 900 megahertz um, unlicensed spectrum, which we can use to deploy hundreds of sensors in a, in a listening zone for a one gateway that will receive the data and send it uh, out to the internet using one modem account. So this, this technology allows us to deploy a network of hundreds of water temperature sensors if we're trying to understand the influx of groundwater into a system. And those um, temperature sensors might only cost uh, 40 bucks and have a, a battery and a radio and a temperature sensor. Um, we're also able to, so as part of this demonstration here, we can see that we have a YSI that's, um, or a Eureka, which is a multi-parameter sonde. And we're actually, for a demonstration, we're uh, relaying that data over to the gateway here, which is solar powered, attached to the bridge, and that's sending it to the internet. Uh, we also have a water level sensor um, that's shown here. So we're able to create these multi-sensor networks. We're able to put sensors in different locations. We don't have to have them all sort of wired into their own, um, in, you know, into one data logger, we can distribute sensors in the best location to take measurements. Um, just a view of some of these sensors. This is a $60 water level sensor. It can measure um, uh, changes in water level every 10 minutes with the precision of almost um, a centimeter or less. And have a battery on board that lasts uh, between five to 10 years, depending on the frequency and your distance to the gateway. Uh, the temperature sensor I mentioned, we could do soil moisture. They have these very cool soil moisture profilers now, which will, this one spike here has four different locations that it's measuring um, soil moisture. Uh, we have a, a $40 radio that we can hook to any data logger um, and send data over this uh, low cost network. Uh, we're also using um, 
a new breed of cell phone companies, which you can um, get the cost of that cellular data down really low. Um, and there's been a lot of changes in the atmospheric side as well. I won't go too much into the atmospheric measurements, but a lot of new sensors are available right now that you can just buy with a credit card. Um, we put a lot of the sensors out next to uh, more expensive counterparts. And this, th this is a closer look at the water level sensor, this one. And you know, we, we did all the PVC stuff on really figuring out how to get that ultrasonic measurement head closer to the water. And then in case the batteries and um, radio up in this top part here. So this, this particular model is about 500 bucks. And I'll show comparison data here. So the orange data is our you know, $500 sensor. They can be as cheap as 60 bucks and you get about the same quality data. And this is compared to a USGS uh, radar based water level sensor. That costs the, the whole system with telemetry and data loggers close to $10,000. Um, so you can see that we get a, a very similar to identical response um, as that USGS sensor. There's a little bit of a temperature dispendency here. Um, so if you're concerned about a millimeter precision um, or don't wanna do a temperature correction, you might just wanna be careful how you use these ultrasonic based um, temperature sensors. Um, the, the project site that we applied those sensors was Old Woman Creek, which is right here by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources site. We installed a, a gateway there. It can cover a, a large portion of uh, Lake Erie across the open water. It, it also has coverage on land. We're also working to install this same LoRaWAN technology in Toledo, Cleveland. Um, we've, we've covered about half of Ann Arbor with uh, a gateway at our office and uh, one at my house. And we're working to put these same gateways out on uh, Lake St. Clair and the Detroit River system. And we're also, oh, I didn't put the University of Windsor on here. The University of Windsor has also installed some gateways um, as well. So you know, I think what we're seeing is um, we're, we're creating, it's a, a organizational ecosystem of partners that are monitoring these systems. We want to have a shared infrastructure of uh, technology as well as a, a low cost way to add new sensors in uh, specific locations. So um, I also uh, have a LSSU graphic on here that Lake Superior State University has uh, worked with us to uh, build their own sensor. So we've sort of helped train them on um, how to how to set these up, the the Arduino programming, and then how to build them themselves. And they're they're deploying these all over the Eastern UP uh, with mostly grants from the Forest Service. So um, you know, I'm really interested to get more sensors out and keep monitoring uh, the environment. Um, one one sensor in particular that I'm really excited about is this sensor mounted on the wall here. It's a autonomous. Uh, nutrient analyzer. So it can um, do wet chemistry for nitrogen and phosphorus in the field. So we load it with reagent bags. It performs all of the um, analytical analysis within a syringe and then pumps it through a detector. And that hooks up to a Raspberry Pi, which is, is really controlling how often this thing takes measurements. And it's connected to a cell modem. Um, so the, this is made by a, I just say a, a cottage industry type manufacturer on the East Coast. We've um, really taken it into Ohio in about a half a dozen spots right now. And it's um, really trying to counter um, the sort of traditional mode of using an ISCO to collect a water sample that needs to be driven to a lab and analyzed later. So just how do we get some um, continuous nutrient data uh, for these very um, flashy type systems where we get rapid changes in phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, this is a, a, just a comparison of some turbidity and temperature data. Um, again, just showing that uh, even if a sensor is low cost, it can still be of, of high quality. Uh, this is another view of that nutrient analyzer. Um, this one in particular was installed at the mouth of the Fox River in Green Bay. And what, what you can see here is um, sort of the traditional 
uh, USGS type basin. And what's not shown here, but it's in the next um, container over is a ISCO water sampler. So, you know, um, how, how do you understand uh, tributary flows of phosphorus into lakes and rivers is you collect a water sample and you have people drive in vans. Um, so in, in Ohio, there's, I, I don't know, probably a half a dozen people's job it is to drive in a van all day and drive around to all these sites and pick up water samples and drive them back. So just an incredible amount of labor that we're paying to sort of maintain this uh, sort of in-person driving and um, and then all these lab costs. So if we can sort of embed that all within a unit that we only need to visit maybe once a month or every six weeks to add some new reagents and we get um, hourly measurements instead of daily measurements. Um, so, it, you know, what I'm talking about is how do we push technology to um, into places that we think uh, managers should be pushing technology that you know, we can cut costs, we can get more data, we can make better decisions. And it's, so it's, it's, it's really about a, a tech transfer project as opposed to, um, you know, Limnotech or me worrying about the uh, management side of these uh, decisions. Um, that sort of concludes my sort of rapid run through. My goal was to just really expose you to the um, uh, types of engineering skills that I've been using in my job in the last uh, 10 years and, and really how those, um, you know, I uh, trickle down into helping the, the city of Toledo understand uh, what the algal bloom is doing, working with uh, biologists that are having to um, invest millions to potentially a billion dollars to reduce the amount of phosphorus running into a system and how technology uh, can help that. Um, so again, if I was there in person, I'd <laughs> thank everyone for attending, but thank you for wherever you are uh, on your couch, in your office. And um, I'm happy to uh, take more questions about what I'm doing. I also wanted to mention uh, for any students that are listening, uh, Limnotech just has posted um, several new job openings. So um, if you think any part of what I talked about was, was exciting and you want to learn more, uh, please check out our website and consider applying for some of the open positions. Thank you. So um, again, if you have a question, um, please raise your hand or uh, you can just go ahead and type your question in the chat and I can read it for you. Okay, um, Emily Shaw, it looks like we've got a uh, hand clapping from Emily Shaw, not a, not a question, but if there are questions, please raise your hand or type in the chat. It's like she wants to be unmuted here, I don't know. I've got um, Noel, I, I can take care of the, the un unmuting. We'll go ahead, uh, Noel, um, I've unmuted you. Okay, yep, thanks. Thanks, Ed, enjoyed the talk a lot. Lots of exciting developments out there. I wanted to ask about the other end, you know, with, with the increased amounts of data coming in, the, and processing the data, interpreting it becomes much more challenging as well. Um, are you to the point yet, you know, of, of using artificial intelligence techniques for processing data and, and looking for patterns or, or what's new on that end? Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good point. And, I, you know, my personal bandwidth ha hasn't been able to expand to include that, that data analysis side. There's, there's certainly others which have done a really good job at the artificial intelligence and you know what's you know i always watch sort of the um marketing use of that term and um what i what i'm most interested in is uh um you know how, how are you actually just how are, how are you actually using it to support a decision so in, in some instances you know i showed the that that plot of um, these two data sources um, you know, artificial intelligence there could actually help us um, 
not have to have it be, you know, that the operator needs to watch data for three years in order to understand how, how to use that data source. So, you know, I'm really interested in how we can use these new data processing techniques to take on this sort of um, long-term memory of these historical data sets to make a decision in the future. Um, I've seen some really good use of AI in um, helping to smooth data, um, time shift data, either forward, backwards, or left or right spatially. Uh, but we, me personally, I haven't used many of these uh, myself, and it's mostly been the um, uh, sensor side and creating new data sources. So there's, there's certainly a whole realm of data science that is adding a, an incredible amount of value. And I think, you know, we're seeing we need both. We can't just uh, have AI pour over historical data. We need to be generating more data sources and, and we need to be working in tandem with these tools. I have seen, um, you know, people that, that hold to this traditional mechanistic view of, um, you know, well, the only way to understand what's happening is to build a mechanistic model. That that is pretty much gone by the by the wayside. That um, we're seeing sensors and AI have an equivalent value, and even stronger in some cases than the sort of uh, mechanistic models that we've historically created to understand how a system is working. So I hope that was a very long answer to uh, no, I'm not doing anything with AI. Great. Um, are there other questions for Ed? All right. Oh, we have um, Judith. I'm going to unmute you. Judith has her hand up. Perlinger. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Ed. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm just curious, you know, a decade or so ago, we were working on these low flow and high flow multi capillary collection devices uh, for doing air water exchange flux measurements. Do you think there's any um, possibility and is it realistic to think that those could be installed on a on a buoy? along with micromet equipment to do these flux measurements? Um, the short, short answer is, is yes. And the, um, the, the long answer is probably, it is that it depends. And, I, you know, a lot of my time now is spent um, talking with either scientists or, or early entrepreneurs that are trying to take that technology to, you know, from I can do this once and it works to um, I want these available uh, to hundreds or, or thousands of, of other people. And there's, there, there's such a um, business aspect to that, just a business school aspect. And what, it, you know, what I remember from my time at tech is uh, I, I never took any business classes and we just had to take one economics class. And so that that sort of um, basic how, how you move from a lab experiment to a first prototype and how that prototype gets um, demonstrated for the potential and what's the market um, potential of this. Um, I, you know, I think it needs more, more support for those other disciplines from um, mechanical engineering to help with prototyping. I've seen that there's uh, very little support for scientists to uh, take some of these lab systems or that have been demonstrated in the field and how do you actually make it compact and, and usable and the costs um, go up considerably on, on that side. So, you know, I just don't know that that sort of prototype and the, and the market answer to your, to your question, but I know others um, have been doing this and there's a lot of venture capital companies that, that really help specialize in that. And I've seen, um, a lot of engineers and scientists just just transition with these ideas um, right from grad school and go and launch, um, you know, their first company to try and 
uh, answer that that very question: Is there a use for this out in the market? So, um, I think uh, just getting more integration with the business school and maybe mechanical engineers can help hone that into a, a product. I hope that helps. I didn't. I don't know too much about the actual market of that particular technology. All right, thanks. And the, the, this is Jennifer Becker. I just wanted to comment that I think that's a really interesting point. When I first came to Michigan Tech in 2010, I put together a team of environmental engineers and, and folks from business and so forth and was put together an IGER proposal on entrepreneurship because I, I thought that that was something that was really um, needed to help move the technologies uh, from the university phase into practice and that, you know, a lot of our students don't have, have the background or the skill set. And so that would be a, an interesting multidisciplinary, um, you know, effort that we could work on. It wasn't unfortunately funded, but it, it's nice to hear your comments because they're consistent with what mm -hmm. um, my thoughts. Now we have another question uh, from Noel. So I'm going to unmute Noel. Go ahead, Noel. Yep. Well, question is kind of twofold. Ed. I'm just wondering, you know, how is your looking for sensors driven by particular needs, or do you hear of a sensor and then find an, an application for it? And so a related question is, you know, what would be the most critical sensor you would like to see developed? Uh, yeah, I mean, the sort of first part is it, it really depends. I mean, um, I've had people uh, just outright approach me and saying, I have this new technology. Um, I think you should use it. In, in, in the last month, I've, I've probably had half a dozen people request an hour. And half the time, I don't know if they're trying to sell me something or if they're just trying to get feedback or, or sort of test what do I think of it. Um, so the, the answer is, I, is, is either people approach me or I go and find it myself. Um, and then the, um, the, the second part of your question right now, I, I would love to see a online, uh, phosphorus, uh, true sensor. I think we've seen the nitrate sort of move to a viable in situ remote, meaning you don't have to visit it every day um, to recalibrate it. Um, so we, we've seen nitrate have a little bit better trajectory on getting an actual sensor. Now there's a lot of people that, again, will say those sensors are garbage and they don't work, but you know, it goes back to my, um, there, there is a lot of really good uses of the nitrate sensors that are on the market right now. And you still need to have a good uh, calibration understanding these aren't uh, sensors that have a 10 year record yet, but they are available. So I'd like to see a phosphorus one. And, you know, once we get into algal toxins, I would certainly like to see an algal toxin sensor. I think the drinking water standards for algal toxins are here to stay. I think they're um, unique in their uh, biological source and sort of the um, unknown reasons why they're made and the concentration. So I think that's going to be a persistent issue for water systems for a long time is algal toxins. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information on the um, health impacts at some of these lower levels, um, but I've seen uh, a lot of money. Um, and usually, if there's uncertainty and we can't measure it, um, the answer is you over-engineer it. And so that's what's happening right now, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing. So most water treatment plants on Lake Erie are moving towards ozone treatment which will solve some other problems as well, but it's a very expensive treatment technology and it's, you know, billion, a billion dollars. I think the city of Toledo is gonna to spend to move towards ozone and all the power systems and other treatment train changes they have to make um, to have ozone. So uh, one, one question in the chat here is, uh, how does the quality of your data of your sensor compared to more traditional? So, I, and are there large interferences that would affect quality? So I think the answer is yes. And you know what I what I try to explore in my technology assessments is what question are you actually trying to answer, and do you need 
millimeter precision radar data in order to answer that. And for the water level question, it's we're mostly just looking for signals. Is if it rained, is the river flowing? If the river's flowing, what are the concentrations? So there's some pretty simple environmental metrics that we're trying to see with just some a $40 sensor versus a $10,000 uh, NOAA grade or USGS grade water level sensor that has to discern, you know, 100 year changes in water level. We're, we're, we're trying to look for um, environmental signals as opposed to even concern, being concerned about the unit. So your question about calibration is that it, it, it really depends when we're looking at water clarity, for example, with turbidity, it's, it, it's all relative anyway. Um, so if you really just, if you wanna compare sensor A to B, you're gonna use some kind of a standard, um, but the, the, the standard question depends again on the question you're trying to answer with your observing system. And what's what work still needs to be done? Um, uh, the, there's a huge gap between um, sensors that are very ubiquitous. So everybody's dishwasher has a turbidity sensor in it that costs about four or five dollars. And if I want to buy a quote turbidity sensor for the environment right now, it's it's about five thousand uh, uh, dollars of an entry point to buy a turbidity sensor. So. $5 to 5,000, there's a lot of space in there to um, develop a new turbidity sensor that costs $50, that costs uh, $500. And what's, what's missing is, is the market in that, in that business plan to say, if we had a $50 turbidity sensor, we could probably sell 100,000 over two years and we need you know, $10 million in venture capital money to develop that. So there's a lot of, uh, application space missing with uh, sensors right now, and even well-known sensors like, like turbidity. We know how to measure turbidity for a very long time, but it's this application space we're just missing. And, you know, you know unfortunately, um, because environmental engineers aren't coming up with this answer for uh, water, for um, natural systems, we have to wait until other applications do it first. So we're seeing companies like Kohler and uh, that make water faucets, they're gonna come up with a turbidity sensor first and we're probably gonna have to use one that Kohler develops out in the natural environment. So, you know, a lot of what I do is watch other spaces and if they can come up with the sensor first then we just go buy it and put it out in the lake. Um, so it, it, you know, which is fine too. It doesn't always have to come from um, one discipline, but it's just making sure we can call up Kohler and saying, hey, can you um, put a cable termination on it so we could put it underwater? Um, so there's some um, specification space that we can navigate. Uh, another question, aren't some algotoxins also volatile? Um, so there is new science showing that um, boat wakes and waves can aerosolize the uh, algal toxins. Um, they're not so much volatile as they are just encapsulated in aerosols that can be inhaled. So that's an in-exposure route, um, but there's not a lot of, I mean, we don't hear of people sitting along Lake Erie and having all these ill effects afterwards. So the, the, health, impacts, the health impacts that move more towards the chronic are, are very difficult to discern. So, you know, I just haven't seen these 10 or 20 year launched epidemiological studies that look at this question. I know uh, we've looked at uh, large scale applications of dioxins um, in, in Michigan in particular at all these reference populations and exposures. And it's, they're, they're, they're very hard to get some of these with any amount of certainty. And I just haven't seen the algotoxin one elevated uh, yet. It's, it's an emerging concern for sure. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think just the number of, of questions that you got shows um, how, how interesting this topic is. We have a lot of interest, obviously, in it at Michigan Tech. So again, thank you, Ed Verhamy. For Verhamy. Um, it was a, a great, great seminar again. And just again, a reminder to folks who want that continuing education um, credit documentation to reach out to Eric Segrin and I am 
still working on our speaker lineup for next week. So stay tuned for that. But thank you everybody for joining. Yep. And again, thank you, Ed. Thank you. I hope to see everyone in May. Thank you. Yes, we hope we hope that works out. Excellent. Okay. And maybe some of the snow will be gone. <laughs> yeah. Great. All right. Bye -bye. Take care.